Another cyclone hits Mozambique. We never know where along the coast they're going to hit, but I've really got my fingers crossed that we're not going to see such intense damage. And cold continues to affect Central Europe and Northeast America. There has been some snowfall as well across parts of Ukraine, but uh, the heaviest snowfall has been across parts of Greece. It's Friday, the 11th of March, and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir, and this is Weathersnap, the insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Africa is a place of tremendous weather extremes, and this variability is currently being felt across the eastern side of the continent. At the beginning of the year, Mozambique, together with a number of other East African countries, was on drought alert. Then, at the end of January, tropical storm Anna produced devastating floods and widespread storm damage. According to the World Food Programme, intense and frequent drought, floods and storms affect the livelihoods of 70% of the population of Mozambique. Right now, communities in the north are amidst yet another storm, this time cycling Goombe. Charmaine Consol Gonzalez is head of programmes with WaterAid in Maputo. Earlier, she described to me the uncertainty local people face. We never know where along the coast they're going to hit, but they do tend to hit the north or the centre of Mozambique, generally, the cyclones. Tell me about how big Mozambique is a country relative to, say, the UK. A coastline is at nearly 2,500 kilometres long. It's a long, kind of narrow country. Um, so, again, you know, there's uh, partly, I think, the reason why Mozambique does get impacted by so many intense weather events Tell me about Storm Anna, which hit at the end of January, because it was an immense storm. We reported on it here. How did it impact the communities where it made landfall? Crops went underwater. Roads and bridges really were quite damaged. Healthcare centres, schools, a lot of public infrastructure, as well as private property. You know, most people are quite poor in Mozambique. We've got a large number of people who live in rural areas, so they don't really have very strong buildings that they live in to start with. So um, I don't think that we really understood that Anna was going to cause such a deluge. Um, So we're still assessing the damage looking at it more from a water and sanitation perspective as water aid to see what kind of damage has been done to what we call wash or water and sanitation infrastructure, particularly in institutional buildings such as schools and health posts, because, you know, we've got to make sure that they have the clean water so that children can get back to school, that the toilets are functioning and that the healthcare centres can actually provide the healthcare to people. Do you know how people are preparing for Gombe? They are trying to get people to move from high-risk areas. Of course, Mozambique is not in a position to provide transport, unfortunately, to support people to move. So they've got to find their own way. Um, it's very unlikely that many people will move. Um, they, they may just go into the schools, for example, or other public buildings that have been designated as evacuation centres. It will be coastal areas, low-lying areas, um, you know, any villages or towns near waterways, for example, along rivers. The government has prepositioned vessels, boats, I guess, to try to help with any rescue that might be required. Um, They've also got metal bridges, you know, ready to go because they're expecting, I think, more damage to roads and bridges, which then makes it, of course, equally as difficult to get in and do any kind of response because access is always an issue during wet season and it's exacerbated once these kind of storms actually do hit and you may have even seen as part of Anna you know there was a brand new bridge it was 45 days old it had just been opened and it you know it was very well built apparently but I think Anna that force of the water was just so unexpected so I've really got my fingers crossed that we're not going to see such intense damage with Gombe Um, but you know it's not just about damage it's just being able to make sure that people are also out of harm's way. Charmaine Consol Gonzalez of WaterAid talking to me from Maputo, Mozambique. Well, to get a meteorological perspective on conditions in Mozambique, I spoke to tropical prediction scientist Julian Hemming. Julian, first of all, let's talk about Cyclone Gombe in terms of its track. Where did it develop and where is it going to make landfall? 
Well, it formed as a tropical storm just to the eastern side of the northern tip of Madagascar a few days ago. And almost as soon as it was named, it came ashore over northern Madagascar. So it weakened then to a tropical depression and passed across Madagascar from the east to the west. Um, but it's now moved back out over the Mozambique Channel in the last day or so, has uh, strengthened rapidly in that area. Talk to me about where it's going next and the intensity of the storm as it makes landfall. Well, having strengthened quite uh, rapidly over the Mozambique Channel, Cyclone Gombe is uh, making landfall over the northern and central parts of Mozambique. Now, it's quite a, a small cyclone in terms of its aerial size. So the areas which will receive the strongest winds could be in excess of 100 miles an hour and a possible storm surge of up to two metres. That'll be a fairly narrow part of the coast. But what's of greater concern is uh, rainfall over the next few days. Gombe, it'll weaken as it moves inland, but over the next three days or so, it's expected to move very slowly and turn southwards and even possibly turn back out to sea eventually. But over the next few days, it'll dump huge amounts of rainfall over Mozambique, areas that were hit earlier in the season, just about six weeks ago from Cyclone Anna. And we could see uh, potentially 200 millimetres of rain locally in some places over 400 in that area in Mozambique and also into Malawi and that could cause some extensive flooding over that region. It's been a really active season. Madagascar has been hit a number of times and these cyclones seem to be following a very similar track. Yes, it, it was actually in the southwestern part of the Indian Ocean. It was actually a very late start to the season. We didn't have any storms during the latter part of 2021. And normally we might get one or two during the last few months of the year. So they didn't actually start forming until about January. Uh, but since then, we have had these five cyclones uh, in the last six weeks or so, which have all made landfall over Madagascar. Now, they haven't all hit in exactly the same places. Uh, we've had uh, some like uh, Gombe, which are over the north of Madagascar, and some further south. So it's not the same places which are being impacted. But it seems that there's been a kind of setup in the atmosphere whereby the storms which are developing this year are continuing on tracks from the east to the west across the southwest Indian Ocean and uh, and coming ashore over Madagascar. When are we expecting the season to ease? Well, the typical end to the season uh, in, in this part of the Southern Hemisphere is around April time. Uh, occasionally, we might get uh, storms later into May. Uh, so th there's the potential for more storms over the next few weeks uh, in the whole of that uh, region in the South Indian Ocean. Julian Hemming, thank you. Thank you. Back to Europe, and much of our continent is currently stuck under what's known as a blocking weather pattern. For the UK, this has meant fairly relentless winds over the last week, together with slow-moving bands of rain and the odd area of brighter sky. At the same time, a strong and stubborn high-pressure cell over central Europe has created a cold wave of air that is showing no inclination to shift to seasonal norms. As Met Office Global Guidance Meteorologist Paul Hutchin explains. We do have large area of high pressure, as you mentioned, across uh, central Europe. What that's done is it's actually resulted in really cold air coming uh, southwestwards from Siberia across parts of Eastern Europe, so all the way really from Western Russia, Poland, down across uh, Ukraine, and even as far south as Greece as well. And we're even seeing quite cold temperatures for the time of year down across parts of North Africa too. How low are the temperatures at the moment? Are they getting above freezing, say, during the day? The temperatures overnight are falling to sort of minus 10, locally minus 15 Celsius. And by day, across a large part of Eastern Europe, they're not rising above freezing as well. So, for instance, some places have seen maximum temperatures of only about minus four or minus five. When you add on uh, some, uh, some fairly brisk winds, you get an additional wind chill as well. But at this time of year, really, we'd be expecting temperatures to rise to about five Celsius above freezing during the daytime. So you can see that it is quite a significant cold wave we're experiencing just now. So not only much lower than average temperatures, freezing conditions, but obviously some bad weather associated with it as well. Yes, Claire. I mean, I mean, generally it's what we call a dry cold wave, but there has been some, some snowfall as well across parts of Ukraine, 
But uh, the heaviest snowfall has been across parts of Greece and the next few days, especially across parts of Turkey. When do you think temperatures will start recovering? Well, there's already a, a recovery in temperature across uh, Poland, and we'll see that milder air mass gradually spread southeastwards across uh, Ukraine and southeast Europe and eventually into Turkey as well. So it will be a, a slow process, but I think by this time next week, much of the area that's experienced this cold wave will be seeing temperatures much closer to what we'd expect for the middle of March. Let's now travel across the Atlantic to North America, where certainly Canada is seeing some ridiculously low temperatures, minus 28, minus 29 across one or two spots across the north. Not only that, they're anticipating another nor'easter. First of all, can you explain what a nor'easter is? A nor'easter really is a rapidly deepening area of low pressure, which tracks from uh, the southeast of the U.S., up the eastern seaboard and then out into the Atlantic to the east of Canada. These systems can produce some very strong winds, heavy rain, but also very heavy snowfall, blizzard conditions as well. Already it's been named as a storm. What's the greatest risks in that region? What we're going to see uh, through the course of Friday is that we'll see some heavy showers and perhaps even some some severe thunderstorms across uh, southeastern parts of the USA. And that's as this nor'easter system starts to develop. And then as we go through Friday night and Saturday, as that system continues to develop and push northeastwards, we will see very heavy rainfall and also some strong winds and potentially also some coastal flooding up the eastern seaboard. But at the same time, with the colder air coming in from the northwest, very heavy snowfall is expected across and to the east of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, In addition to that, uh, we are also likely to see stronger gale force winds developing in association with heavy snowfall. And so we could see some blizzard conditions and some very large drifting of the already heavy snowfall that's going to be accumulating. Paul Hutchin. So will there be any let up in wet and windy conditions here in the UK this weekend? With the outlook, Helen Roberts. Quite a changeable weekend to come as a large area of high pressure across the continent tends to block weather systems across the UK. Saturday is a day of sunny spells and showers and some of those showers will be quite heavy, especially across the northern half of the UK, but they'll tend to fade from the south as the day progresses leading to more in the way of drier and brighter conditions in the south on Saturday afternoon. It'll be a windy day with a brisk southerly wind, but that will field mild air from the south, so temperatures a little above average for the time of year. Sunday looks like a wet and windy day, particularly windy in the northwest. Still on the mild side, but cloudy for most with outbreaks of rain at times during the course of the day. Thanks, Helen. Just before we go, Martin Bowles is here with last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK extremes for the first week of meteorological spring, recorded between Monday the 28th of February and Sunday the 6th of March. The highest temperature was 13.6 degrees Celsius at Santum Downham in Suffolk on Monday. Catesbridge in County Down, Northern Ireland was the coldest place. Minus 5.6 degrees were recorded here early on Tuesday morning. The wettest day was Wednesday in the far north of Scotland. 55.4 millimetres of rain was measured at Cathley in Sutherland. Norfolk was the sunniest county. 10.2 hours was recorded at Weybourne on Sunday. Thanks, Martin. That's it for Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.